zoning. So if there's a developer that's going to build, you know, 200 market rate homes, 15% of the land has to be set aside for affordable housing. And so we get that land free and clear. Then we actually turn around and tell the, and, and uh, partner with the developers so they build our houses while they're building theirs as well. But ours are sold to that particular target. Oh, is, it's an exaction we took it from the developer. Yes. Yeah. So you took even me and you.
to create an after school program or a summer program or a, a, a clinic, a community clinic. Okay. You yeah. can do yeah, all those things, right? Yeah. So it's whatever you choose as a community when you decide on your land trust, what your mission is going to be. And if part of your mission is beyond housing, and you want community control, and you want some of the community assets to be providing those local services, then you have the power to incorporate them into your plan. There was a study published recently by Shelter, which I think kind of possibly gets that, which said for every one pound spent on decent, family-sized, affordable housing, you've got a five pounds return in terms of that's still healthy people, but it's spaces for young people to study, um, and those kind of applications. But there were three, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, you want to ask a question, then we'll round up. Can you remind me? My question has been covered quite nicely. Yeah, you said that 15% um, of the um, government land was going to be development was going to be set aside for the European land trust. We've had two different mayors of London that have promised affordable housing in areas like Chelsea Harbour and also around the other two, and there has been no affordable housing because it wasn't legally put down. Now, is yours a legal sort of arrangement? Um, no. Because actually, the inclusionary housing, it's an option. They can actually either give money or they can give the land. So the difference between, and obviously we want the land, because you know the money wouldn't be done by the land. Yeah. But what made the difference was the political will, right? That's what you're talking about. And how that came about was me, basically, as a nonprofit, developing a relationship with the head of that housing department. Forget the elected officials, to a certain extent. Um, <laughs> work with the staff. If you, if you work with the staff, the staff that knows about housing, they, they've been there, they've got the institutional history, they know what works and what doesn't work, and a lot doesn't work. This works, and we've got the data to prove it. Then you, you can have that as your portal into yeah. And so that's what happened with us. And, and so the way it was presented, it was rather a stronger message that we preferred this and that's what we uh, We've got a member of the staff for this this evening, but for the sake of letting her get home anytime soon, I think I'll protect her identity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have one final question, sir, back. Um, you said it's very important to have heroes or sort of people to lead the community. Uh, I guess as they mostly come up from the 60s, those communities are still being led by the same people that started them, am I right? Oh no, really? No, no. In fact, another thing I admire the most about the Pudley Street Neighborhood Initiative is they've groomed a new generation of leaders from their youth. Right. They have a very active youth program. In fact, they reserve a seat on their governing board for youth. And the person who is the executive director of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative today was in that youth program when he was 14 years old. And the guy who administers their community land trust subsidiary uh, was 12 years old when he first started becoming involved with the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. It's, you know, leadership succession is absolutely key, right? You don't build these organizations on the basis of personalities. Maybe they're created, they're energized, they're founded, but unless you institutionalize leadership succession, you groom the next generation, you have some turnover, your organizations fail. Yeah. Yeah. So no, the same people that created a lot of these CLTs, they look like me today. Their beards are white, their heads are bald, they kind of need to sit down, and it's the young people that have taken over the organization. Do you see a lot of, do you have, you have, you have do you see a lot of talk about sort of lots of people moving in and moving out of the community? Because obviously, um, in this area, you've got lots of people moving in and moving out quite rapidly, within sort of, um, it depends on the, on the demographic. I mean, young people who are just starting their lives coming out of college, um, yeah. or leaving high school and going into trades, um, they will stay in the housing for a shorter duration than a family that moves in at 25 and it's has hard. several kids. Yeah, yeah. Starting to put down where it is. So it's another reason to have a diversity of types, you know, and to always have some of that housing that turns over and create some opportunities for people. We have people who been in our housing, they've left the housing, left the community, and then they've come back after they got married to buy a home from us. Yeah. So that's a good cycle for us. Yeah. I'm so sorry, it's two minutes past. <laughs> <laughs>